Kara, thank you so much for joining us this morning. Um, this headline really caught our eye because it, uh, immediately you talk about the Serengeti wildebeest. Um, the pictures that we've seen in all those documentaries over the years immediately comes to mind. It's one of those bucket list things that, that many people have been able to take that trip to see it with their own eyes. Why did you decide to compare uh, the impala to the Serengeti wildebeest in their migrationary uh, um, uh, uh, patterns? <laughs> um, I think the, it's, in, it's in what they do. Um, so what's behind um, the whole Serengeti migration is that they're trying to track the best food resources through the landscape over time. So uh, they don't change what they eat, but they change where they eat. So they move through the landscape and um, find, the best, where the, find where the best food is available. Impala are doing the same thing, except that they don't move around. So they change what they eat, and they shift from eating grass in the wet season to eating uh, tree leaves or browse in the dry season. Um, and so are able to track the best food resources um, through the seasonal cycle um, by migrating in their diet, so not in space. So it's, it's that switch that we, we're talking about as the, uh, as the migration. Why the focus on that now? Is it something that's only recently uh, become a talking point in the world or the academic world that you uh, move in? Um, no, I, th I think, I mean, like understanding the, the dietary composition and that of, of an impala is, you know, that's, that's uh, long known. Um, our, our question was much more around like what controls, um, what makes some animal species more abundant than others? Mm. Um, and I think the species that have become really abundant, they, they're doing one of three things. Um, so one is to uh, move spatially, so as the Serengeti wildebeest, um, and the other, so that's trying to solve the, the food availability um, problem. Um, the other is to be very big to avoid predation, so that you, you avoid sort of the top-down um, predation pressure problems. But unrecognized was um, what an extraordinary role um, switching your diet can play in increasing mm. animal population sizes. So while that dietary switch is well known, um, the consequences of that had not been recognized. Um, and so Carla came along with uh, just keeping her eyes open and crew and with that, that simple question, like, why are there so many? Mm. And then uh, through that, we realized that this is a general phenomenon. Uh, and the KwaZulu-Natal Park Senyala are very abundant. Um, and as you go, th go north um, and sort of into East Africa, you also see um, these mixed feeding, these dietary migration species being very abundant. Do, do we know whether uh, the impala have always um, had these dietary migration patterns or is it something that evolved um, over time? And do we know of any other animals who have taken tips from that and for their own survival have changed the way that they eat? Uh, sure, look, so um, that, that dietary generalism is something that would have um, evolved um, in impala uh, and, and a number of other species. Um, and in a way that being a generalist is their specialization, mm. you know, so that, that ability to switch between things, uh, you know, um, broadens their food base, but at the same time, um, to do that, so for example, a, a giraffe, um, would make a very inefficient grazer, but it's specialized to, to browse off the top of trees. So, uh, uh, there's just these things that uh, different species can make use of, and impala happen to have involved in, in that space. Another example would be something like a, an elephant. They also mm. switch their diet a lot, but, but they've got the added benefit of being also very large and predator-proof in a way. Uh, um, so, yeah, so there's potential for them to be very abundant too. Would this kind of research also feed into uh, looking into the future? Obviously, we know our weather patterns are changing as we speak. Um, Drought has been a massive issue um, over the last time, and, and we always hear from our experts that work in national parks that, you know, um, like with all things, the animals evolve, um, and, and that's what we expect to see. Uh, uh, focusing on the research that you've done on this, if, if we see a more arid and drier areas uh, taking um, center stage over the next mm -hmm. few decades, are we likely to see a change also in the, these kinds of eating habits and, and patterns of especially our savanna animals? Um, I think, yeah, I think the major change is that um, the ability to move, uh, for animals to, to show a movement response to changing conditions, um, 
has really been restricted by land use change, fencing, you know, all, all sorts of um, human pressures on the landscape. Um, so something that we take from the work that we've done then is that we realize that probably the most abundant animals sort of going forward, given that, um, given the lack of space, are going to be the, the animals that can uh, migrate in situ. So a species like impala, are, given the way the world is now, are probably going to be the most dominant uh, or the most abundant animals mm. uh, in national parks um, and other areas. And certainly with um, climate change and um, what we'd expect is, is more droughts, more variability. Um, so to be able to have these adaptations that get you through the crunch times that mm. don't rely on movement, um, we would expect those animals to, to do better um, in, in the changing future that, we, that we're looking at. Fascinating stuff indeed. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, that's uh, Dr. Gareth Hempson. Uh, he is from Wits University School of Animal, Plant and Environmental Sciences, coming to us live there from Manguzi in, uh, Manguzi in KwaZulu-Natal.